Um, look, it's obviously a, a bit of a new thing for, for all of us to do these, these meetings via Zoom. And for me, you know, the, the bit that I miss the most is that, you know, as with most presentations, you rely on the interaction with the audience um, to get that real time feedback. And, um, and importantly, also, you know, I, I want you to be able to, you know, ask questions, you know, at any stage, but I think in order to make it maybe go a little bit easier and a little bit smoother, I think, let me go ahead with the entire presentation. And then just along the way, just jot your questions and then um, we're going to just discuss them um, afterwards. I think it's gonna be easier that way than trying to see whose hand is up and um, who wants to ask a question. So, you know, our topic for this evening is damage control orthopedics. And it's obviously a, a term that I've decided to keep uh, for, you know, I think, historical reasons because as you know that you know we should really be talking about you know appropriate care uh, instead of what uh, what damage control is and of course if you say damage control then we tend to you know contrast that to any total care as if it's two diametrically opposed concepts but as we're gonna see um, during the the presentation that it's actually just you know a spectrum. Uh, it's a continuum between um, early total care and damage control. But really, what we should be practicing is more in you know sort of middle ground, and that's what is now called early appropriate care. And uh, and of course, the subheading is uh, learning, um, unlearning, and relearning, which is uh, something I've spoken to some of you about previously that, you know, you need to make sure that, you know, in certainly, I mean, in life, but definitely in orthopedics that most things we think we know are evolving concepts. So you need to be dynamic enough to be able to change with the times where change is appropriate. So you need to be able to learn, to unlearn and to relearn. So there's no room for, you know, for, for dogma or, you know, left versus, versus right kind of approach. So it's, uh, it's, it's a very vast topic. So I think tonight we'll discuss only the, you know, the salient points. So it's more like an, an appetizer for you guys. And um, if you like what you hear and you want to get into the main course and even dessert, there are lots of courses that are offered uh, internationally, locally and regionally that are dedicated to the concept of damage control. So you can have a whole two day course on what we'll try and, and discuss in probably uh, a little over an hour uh, for my presentation. So it's really just to guide you, but there's lots of uh, literature available out there. And uh, like I said, the literature evolves, excuse me, evolves all the time. See if bandwidth, sorry, you can't see me now. I'll put myself on at the end. So um, some of you, or many of you, or all of you are probably too young uh, to know um, this writer. His name is Alvin Toffler, and I'll be very impressed if, um, if any of you know, know, know him. But uh, so he's a writer and a futurist. So it's a very nice job or title to have, you know, um, as a futurist because all you do is predict the future and if you get it wrong people will forget you ever said anything but if you get it right they will never forget that you know you could predict you could predict what was going to happen so his most uh, popular book is future shock and in that book he wrote that um, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. And like I said, this is what this uh, discussion is about uh, tonight. Uh, many of you have seen the animation on YouTube, um, anesthetic and orthopedic registrar, uh, or the orthopedic guy just wants to nail the femur regardless of what the patient looks like um, or, or what his physiology is like, you know, there's a fracture, I need to fix it. 
So hopefully after this lecture, there's going to be a whole let a whole less uh, of you that have this approach to fracture care. So we'll discuss the rationale for damage control surgery and um, just touch on how to identify the patient at risk. Uh, we'll discuss the, uh, the, the importance of proper resuscitation and, um, and then importantly also to identify and monitor the borderline patient. And I know some of you are thinking, but this is not orthopedics. But anyway, you're soon going to be in the, in the COVID wards. So you need to be able to think beyond the fracture and look at the patient as a whole. And uh, we'll discuss the techniques that uh, we, 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 we employ uh, when we uh, deal with these patients. I'm not really going to touch much on the literature, but I'll sort of just point a few articles along the way which have dictated, you know, and have been quoted by most uh, proponents of uh, whatever uh, approach they choose to, to follow. And as again, with most things, you know, you can decide what you want to do and you're bound to find literature that supports, uh, that supports your stance. So just by way of definition, so how do we define damage control orthopedics? And um, basically it is an approach to orthopedic fracture care that aims to contain and stabilize orthopedic injuries in the multiple injured patient. And the whole idea is that you want the physiology to improve. And the priorities are one, to control the hemorrhage. You want to stabilize major fractures, manage soft tissue injuries, and um, but importantly, you want to minimize the degree of surgical insult, and this we're going to discuss later. So now, you know, patients um, who are not able to be adequately resuscitated due to polytrauma, or also we'll discuss patients who are physiologically unstable. And then there's also like a very special group of patients uh, who are probably, probably the most difficult to deal with. And those are the borderline patients who, as much as they look fine at the moment, but they would be at risk if you were to sort of involve them um, in prolonged surgery or, um, or anesthesia. So the whole idea is to reduce the impact of the second hit. And that's what we call that uh, the operations would do uh, the, the second hit. And uh, talking about the second hit, I'm going to take you to another book, which um, certainly, you know, I mean, you, it's, you, you, as you can see, it's sold over 15 million, million copies, and it's a very popular book. It's a little bit, of course, outdated. It's probably from the 60s, 70s, but it's the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and some of you may have read it. And one of the seven habits is that you should begin with the end in mind. And that's very appropriate um, in this instance, because ultimately, like I said, you want to reduce the impact of the second hit. And all our, all our interventions are aimed at, um, at, at uh, reducing that impact. So that is the end that we have in mind um, from the beginning. So I'm gonna take you back on a bit of a history lesson um, that, you know, the kind of care we offer patients today has evolved you know, over the years and um, you know and there are probably three or four distinct time periods uh, that are or, or that have been followed uh, in terms of, of fracture care. So the first era was in in, you know, in the 1980s or before the 1980s and this was called you know the dark era in fracture care where if you are polytraumatized the treatment you received was non-operative and also resuscitation and, and ICU care was still not at the levels that it's at today. So because it took forever to stabilize patients, invariably there was a delay in treatment and the patients never got surgery because they were deemed to be too sick to operate on. So if you came in with the bilateral femur fractures, tibia fractures, you got traction basically. And uh, the outcomes were very poor because of, you know, prolonged uh, immobilization, prolonged recumbency, DVTs, pneumonias. So the outcomes were not really that good. And um, that's what is called the, the dark era. And then in, in the early 80s and sort of early 90s, 
there was then a swing towards early operative care. And of course, this came with the development in, in the understanding of physiology, in invasive monitoring, and uh, in, um, in how to take care of patients in ICU. And there was certainly enough literature that showed that immediate um, and definitive stabilization of fractures had better outcomes compared to non-operative care. So this was done regardless of the physiology of the patient and regardless of how long it took to get uh, the fractures fixed. And uh, this was the main study that, you know, that came out that was quoted for a long time by proponents of early total care. And uh, basically they looked at the outcomes in ICU in patients who had their femur fractures stabilized before, well at or, or before 24 hours and those who were uh, fixed 48 hours later. And they could demonstrate that um, polytrauma patients with a high injury severity score, if they received early, fix early fixation of their femur fractures, they had a reduced uh, length of stay in ICU, reduced hospital length of stay, but importantly, the dreaded complications in ICU, which are ARDS, uh, basically all the pulmonary complications, were reduced in these patients who received early total care. So this was now the, the, the enlightened era. And um, so like I said, the treatment now was uh, operative intervention for all the patients. It was done early. And this was coupled with um, aggressive resuscitation and ICU care. So much so that patients now were deemed too sick to not operate on. So if you wanted to save the life of a polytrauma patient, you had to fix their long bone fractures immediately. And certainly when I joined ICU at Hodeski, uh, you know, Lance Michel was still the boss, this was 2004. There was a role that thou shalt nail all femurs. So you would not get an ICU bed if your femur nail was not nailed or was not to be nailed. Because like I said, they could demonstrate uh, better, better outcomes with, with early aggressive care. But now, earlier in the, I mean, early in the 90s, then suddenly there were a few, what were initially called dissenting voices which started talking against this concept of aggressive electoral care. And they started appreciating the systemic effects of ringing, you know, and, um, and as much as you know, electoral care was meant to reduce ARDS incident, but there are some patients who actually developed ARDS, you know, in association with early treatment of their long bone fractures. Also, there were some patients. So now remember, I'm not saying that all the patients who had total care had these problems, but there was a subset of patients who would come in without the problems, but then develop them if they received total care. And um, so now the challenge was now to identify which patients were now too sick again to operate on. And again, just to reiterate, the majority, let's for is or, or, or of argument's sake, say 90% of patients were still treated successfully with early total care, but now they were that there was a 10% that got worse because of early total care. And that's where the challenge um, was to identify those patients early and not offer them early total care, which would be detrimental um, to their outcomes. So, and the whole idea was to stop this concept of fixing everyone, where you started from, you know, clavicle to the big toe, fixed everything, you had the best x-rays, but the patient ends up in the mortuary with those best x-rays. So this is, uh, I don't know how many of you have been to this uh, skydiving place in, uh, um, on the west coast uh, of Cape Town. So this guy uh, went for skydiving and unfortunately his parachute malfunctioned. Uh, so he landed quite badly and that was the, the outcome. And, um, and of course, during, or at the time, knowing what we knew, you know, the whole idea was to take him to theater. And of course, also he's young, so you know, he's going to be fairly, you know, he's, he's going to compensate quite well for his, um, hypovolemia. So that was his low docs, bilateral femur, bilateral tibias, and he's got a right um, forearm fracture. 
and that's what we did. Uh, bilateral femur nails and tibia nail, um, tibia X fix, and it was so aggressive. We even plated his um, his ulna in the same sitting. Unfortunately, the outcome was um, was bad. He did not make it, and and of course, you know, when he came in, he had no intra-abdominal injuries. You know, he had no demonstrable um, pulmonary injuries, but you know, he just he had ARTS and he just got into um, just a horrible spiral, which was never able to get out of, and he he demised. So that that just shows you the the downside, you know, to to early total care, and so this guy succumbed to multi-organ failure. So now, um, so this is the one paper now that again gets quoted a lot by by people that say that you know you should uh, you know not perform any total care you know uh, because of the uh, pulmonary complications. So if anyone has got a head injury or has got a chest injury, you are not to nail the femur, you know, primarily. And um, it's always misquoted because if you read the whole paper, you know, the, their conclusion is that provided a patient is fully resuscitated, none of these things above matter, you know, so you can rim the femur, you know, there's no difference. So it's not the femur nail per se that will tip them over uh, into um, physiologic um, abnormalities. It is basically the thoracic injury that determines your extent of pulmonary dysfunction. And it's really independent of the fracture fixation method. But like I said, importantly, this only matters if your patient is fully resuscitated. So if your patient is fully resuscitated, you can nail the femur, you're not going to cause any, you know, any problems. So um, going back now to the concept of the, you know, of the first and the second hit. So what is the first hit? It's exactly that, it's the first hit. That's what you get at the time of the accident and whatever injuries you sustain from that, uh, from the impact. And uh, you may or may not succumb to all the injuries. But if you survive the first hit, now there's a concept of the second hit, which then comes after the initial hit. So those are the patients who have survived the first trauma, they've gotten to hospital, but now the immune system is primed, you know, from, uh, from all the inflammatory reactions. Uh, so they're very vulnerable to the second insult and they have a, and of course surgery is, a, is an insult to the body. And uh, so they, they tend to have an amplified systemic response to, to further, further insult. And, and then they get a pathological inflammatory response, which will then lead to a multi-organ failure. So this is what we're trying to avoid by um, oh, with the concept of damage control surgery. And so what is uh, the second hit? Second hit can be anything, can be caused by incomplete resuscitation. So you come in, you are shocked, you compensate for the shock, but three, four hours later, you are still not resuscitated properly. So now your body eventually, you know, gives up and that is the second hit. You get the second hit from excessive blood loss um, because again, um, that uh, puts a higher demand on your cardiovascular system. But also infection and surgical procedures also predispose you to, or also, uh, they actually are second hits themselves. So those are the things that you want to avoid. And damage control of the pedics is aimed at minimizing the impact of the second hit. So now the most difficult part in deciding uh, who will benefit from damage control of the pedics is that, you know, there's very, you know, there are varying differences amongst individuals in terms of your genetics. Some are just more exposed to um, hyperion response. Some are not uh, but vulnerable. So there's no single test that will tell you, okay, this one you go for damage control, this one you go for edit to edit total care. So there are things we look at uh, like FPC, uh, the base excess, um, the lactate, and uh, basically the, all the things that measure tissue oxygenation and, and, and anaerobic response. And then some of the newer ones like, um, you know, the interleukins and, and PCT. But like I said, those are just laboratory markers, but the decision between any, any total care versus damage control is not a laboratory decision. 
per se. It's a clinical decision, which you can then use the laboratory findings to try and, um, and support your decision. So how do you apply this concept to orthopedics? So it starts off, of course, with common sense. That hypovolemic shock requires transfusion of blood products. And of course, we do this to, to prevent anaerobic respiration. And uh, when you take patients to the theater and you cut them open, you're taking blood out of the patient, you're putting the blood onto the floor. So these two concepts in a bleeding patients are competing and they're not compatible. So you can have both. Um, so how do you practice this? Um, so long bone fractures need to be stabilized acutely. So that's the first priority. And um, so now what we need to decide again is who gets early definitive treatment and which now that tricky subgroup, so which subgroups are going to get staged treatment. So how do you measure the end of uh, resuscitation? So, you know, resus is complete when the oxygen debt has been repaid and the tissue, oxid tissue acidosis is eliminated. And this is what you're going to get once you've given your blood products and your fluid and tissue oxygenation is back to normal. And just be careful of young patients who will have normal vital signs. So that's why we don't look at the blood pressure only. You want to be able to measure tissue oxygenation. So things, that's why the, the, the blood gases matter and, uh, and lactate. Because some patients may have occult shock. Um, so at Holoscape, we use mostly lactate and, um, and, and base access. And um, you know, pH, is, uh, gastric pH is used in some in some uh, in some centers, but we don't use that routinely. So we tend to use lactate, and of course, the lactate is going to be normal or abnormal. If it's normal, that is good. It's a good thing, but it doesn't mean you're out of the woods completely. If it's abnormal, then you look at the trend. Um, so it's going to be abnormal, but improving. And remember, these are serial examinations. It's not just one lactate. You have to do them a, a few couple of minutes apart. Um, so if it's improving, that's a good thing. If it's getting worse, that is a bad thing, obviously. But if you are continuing with the resuscitation, you're giving products, but the lactate is staying the same. It means you are not catching up with tissue oxygenation. Uh, so that is also a bad thing. So you want your lactate to improve and not stay the same if it's abnormal. So um, which patients are you not going to consider damage control surgery in? Of course, it's patients who are clinically and biochemically adequately resuscitated and they're hemodynamically stable. And uh, so by that, you mean that your patient has got adequate coagulation, they have a normal temperature, because remember the, the, uh, the, the triad of hypothermia, coagulopathy, and I um, can't remember the third one, I'll, I'll think about it now. Um, so you want them to have a, st a stable oxygenation, normal, um, normal, uh, ventilator status and you want the lactate to be normal. So, uh, so the aim of fracture management in the severely ill patient is slightly different from the, the, you know, the aim of management in patients who, are, who have a normal physiology. So it is not that we don't treat the damage control patient, but the treatment is staged. And so there's definitely going to be no early definitive treatment. So we're aiming for temporary stabilization. And the goal there being that you want to stabilize the fractures. And by doing so, you want to minimize, and you're going to achieve that by minimizing operative time. And you're going to prevent um, uh, hypothermia and, uh, and, and, um, and hypercoagulability. So this is a guy that came off his motorbike uh, on the M3. He's, he's a soldier, so he was referred to us from the military hospital, came off his motorbike. And if you look at his chest on the left, 
uh, he's um, his, his, his chest is he's wiped out. He's wiped. He's got a pneumothorax, and he's got a femur fracture, of course, on the right, and the forearm fracture as well. So now this, of course, came after we've been enlightened into how to treat um, these patients. So the approach is okay. So so for the next couple of slides, just keep this guy in mind and have your own surgical or have your own surgical plan for him. Right. So, what are the concepts underlying damage control of the pedics? So, like I said, you want to avoid um, prolonged um, surgery that's going to take more than 90 minutes. And you want to try and achieve as much as you can, hopefully, everything within that 90 minutes. Of course, it's an ongoing discussion, and we see this all the time in the Monday morning meetings that it's a discussion you have with your anesthetist all the time. So you don't make a once-off decision that, okay, this guy is too well, I'm going for total care, or this guy is too sick, I'm going for damage control. If you start and his physiology is normal, but by the time you're done with his femur nail, his lactate is not climbing, you know, there's something wrong there. So you're going to have to have a plan B and reconsider your surgical plan. Um, so it's not one-off it's, it's one decisions, it's an ongoing assessment. And importantly, it needs to be experienced people who are making the decisions. And um, so once you've done the damage control part, then we do what, so it's a different kind of timeout to the preoperative timeout. So it's timeout in the sense that we're done with the first part of the operation of the surgery or of the orthopedic part. Then he goes to ICU for, for further care and resuscitation. Then it's going to come back to PHN a couple of days later once everything is normalized. Okay, so the whole idea with damage control then is that you want to convert that lethal triad of hypothermia, acidosis, and coagulopathy. And by you know, by, by applying these principles, you want to convert it to the holy trinity, which is resuscitative surgery, ICU care and definitive um, stabilization. And again, keeping in mind that if you combine inadequate resuscitation with prolonged surgery, that is a death sentence for most patients. So avoid that um, at all cost. So like I said, um, again, um, we're gonna keep discussing the same thing that um, it's very difficult to identify with a set number of criteria who needs no damage control of the pedics besides the polytrauma patient that's obviously shocked and hypothermic. But you get that borderline patient who has a predisposition to, de to deteriorate and those are the ones you must identify. And, uh, and how can you tell? And again, like I said, it's very difficult to define this physiologically just by giving you a set of, of, of figures and numbers to look out for. But it's a clinical assessment. You need to look at the hemodynamic instability uh, so here they, you know we just make an example with someone who's had more than 25 units of blood you look at the at the lethal triad um, uh, parameters again chest or lung contusions and the other things that are not physiological um, are the last two so if the proposed surgery is very complex so a patient may well be fine physiologically, but now you want to go and do a complex, you know, pelvis or acetabular uh, reconstruction, or you want to do, you know, a uh, popliteal artery repairs, but basically anything that's too complex, that'll take a long time, will then affect what you choose to do. You know, that is, you know what, instead of trying to, to perform this complex surgery, Let's stabilize him now until we get the correct expertise to come into the complex surgery. And also at the same time, you must look at the capabilities of your unit. You know, you may well be able to do the orthopedic part yourself, but your hospital doesn't have an ICU. So th there's no, no value and, um, and wisdom in treating that patient in an inappropriate facility. So again, you're going to apply your X-fix and, uh, and transfer to an appropriate facility. And so in that concept, we often call those X-fixes, you know, traveling traction. Right, so I spoke about the lactate. Um, so lactate, we look at the, again, we look at the trend. It's like, you know, the traffic light. 
If it's less than two, then that is a good thing. You must plan to proceed. If it's above 2.5, you stop and you plan to get that lactate back to normal or you start thinking about damage control surgery. And then if it's in the orange zone between two and 2.5, so now that's where you look at the trend. If the trend is downwards, that's a good thing, you can proceed. But if a trend is upwards, it means you are heading towards dangerous um, territory. So what do you do for stage one? You want to stop the bleeding. So you want to decon so and in, in that order. So if there's any obvious bleeding that gets stopped, you decontaminate any gross um, uh, contamination. And if there's any vascular injuries, this is not the time to try and reconstruct. All you do is just pre fuse using a shunt. And then if there's a concern with compartment syndrome, you're going to uh, decompress those compartments. But importantly, if you look at this guy on the right, that is what you don't want to see. You know, that guy is, I mean, he's in trouble, he's got lots of injuries, but also he's exposed in theater. And, and that is where he's going to get cold. So what about the primary bony procedure? Of course, uh, you want to stabilize the fracture. Um, Oh, just one more thing before I forget. Obviously, I, I, I'm sharing my whole screen. I cannot see you guys at all. So if there are any issues, um, maybe I, um, you can hear me or I've long stopped uh, moving the slides. Just send a message on, I'm on WhatsApp, please. And then I'll, I'll check it out and correct whatever the, the situation is. So with, with a primary bony procedure, you want to stabilize your fractures. And um, so like I said, it's going to be a temporizing thing and definitive treatment will come later. Now the one concern of course is, um, you know, if you do an X, fix, so remember that we want to save time. So if you do an X fix in the femur versus a femur nail, the operative time is gonna be shorter and the blood loss is less. So the current teaching is that you should do an X fix. I know some people will then ask, you know, but I can just throw in an unrimmed uh, femur nail retrograde just as quickly. That's fine too, if you really can do it that quickly. And then the other concept, which I'll discuss later, is using a minimally invasive plating as an internal X fix. Okay. So that's what we did for our motorbike guy. So he had a damage control surgery initially, so X fix for the femur. And uh, once they took care of his lungs and physiology in ICU. So um, now when you stabilize the, the, the skeleton, you need to keep in mind uh, your pin placement. Again, we hammer on this, um, you know, in, in the Monday morning meeting, you know, about planning your definitive procedure. Remember to begin with the end in mind. So same, same concept. So when you put your X fix pins, Make sure that you put them away from where your definitive plan, your definitive fixation is going to be because you don't want to contaminate the surgical field with the X fix. Your pins need to be bicortical. Um, so let's hold one second. I see now Jimmy is sending me a message. Maybe you can't hear me. Okay, no. So um so you need, again, like I said, the same principles, uh, meticulous care for soft tissues, have a stable construct. And if there are any open wounds, remember that the plastic surgeons are not, uh, no, are gonna get involved. So give them enough access to the wound, but also for your own vacuum dressing. The last thing you want is you do an X fix and you cannot get you now to apply the vacuum dressing um, because of your pin placement. So keep those things in mind. And I know some of you are looking at that femur plate um, with the long screw on the medial femur condyle. That is not the X-ray of this guy. I just put it there to show you that when you do the pin placement, just keep in mind that you may need to plate later on. So keep your pins far. Um, and then I said, so minimal invasive plating is an option. Nowadays, there are certain centers in the UK that do this as their default um, method for facing the femur and it's something that we actually want to or we're going to explore for Hodeskia to have just one uh, set that's 
uh, got a long femur plate, um, basically for for me for in fix x fix kind of um, construct, so that you don't have to have an x fix on. And the beauty with the plate is that once you put it there, it's out of the way for everyone, and the patient can be in ICU for as long as required. You don't have the concerns of uh, pin track sepsis. You don't have the concerns about you know how much can you how much you can keep the pins in place before you convert to a nail and the risk of infection. So all those things you now go go out the window if you've used a plate to stabilize your femur. Now, um, so uh, um, like I said just now, the concern is always if you put a femur X fix, you know how much time do you have before you need to convert to a nail and what are the infection rates? Basically. Anything that you do within two weeks, you know, so, so if, if you do conversion from x fix to nail within two weeks, your infection rates are similar to primary or, or virgin nailing. Yeah. It's only um, that, you know, pin site contamination increases after about two weeks. So you want to convert from IM nail, I mean, to convert to IM nail within two weeks. But at the same time, you don't want now to convert so early from your X fix to your nail that you, you know, you defeat the purpose of having done damage control in the first place. So you, for example, put your X fix today and then, you know, within like tomorrow afternoon, you are there and you're converting now already to the nail. It just defeats the purpose. And of course, you know, you, you, you have not managed to avoid the second hit that you tried to avoid. So yeah, back to our guy. So a couple of day, a couple of, of days later, he got converted from an X fix to a nail, and uh, also plated his forearm, and that is his outcome. And you know he did not go on to to infection. Right. So that was stage one, the damage control part. So stage two now, when do you then proceed to early to to definitive stabilization of your fractures? And um, again, this is a seminal article that gets quoted millions of times. Um, so you basically try and avoid going to theater within the first two to four days after the initial uh, resuscitation and, and damage control. And those are the most vulnerable days, days two to four. After day five, the immune modulation um, tends to, to settle down and it becomes and all safer and safer to to go back so um what do you achieve by performing damage control of the, uh, approaches there's a reduction in theater time because of like i said you, you x fix and backslap you don't do anything more than that importantly you reduce blood loss from the lack of open surgery and um and like i said uh, a temporizing x fix and at least a conversion to a nail or a plate has been shown to not increase the rate of complications. So it's absolutely safe. So the conclusion in this paper was that damage control of the pedics with early and one stage conversion seems to be a safe strategy of primary fracture treatment in patients with multiple injuries. So to summarize, um, who needs damage control surgery? It's basically sick polytrauma patients. That is patients who are borderline or patients who are unstable or patients who are in extremis. So that, that's the physiology part of it. But also there is a, a cases where the physiology may be fine, but the institution is not able to cope. And the perfect example is mass casualty scenario. So if you remember, um, you know, I remember in Haiti, when there was a, a, that um, the, the earthquake. So when the surgical missions go to those places, they don't bother with nails and plates, they carry X fixes because everybody gets an X fix. You know, X fix and you move out the way, X fix, move out the way. So that is also you no know, um, damage control. And then later on when things are better, they can then uh, deal with them decide definitively. So like, like I said at the beginning, you know, it's a, uh, the concept of any total care versus damage control is not a major philosophical argument. So, you, know, you cannot say, you no, know, I'm a plate up and no, I'm a nailer. You know, 
there's no like no I, I'm a damage control person and the other one says I am a early total care person so there's no philosophical you know, argument to be heard there and um, actually it's still you know you'll still get to some meetings where they're going to have a an orthopedic debate you know early total care versus damage control and and the truth is that it really is a management strategy that is based on patient physiology, understanding the mechanics, and importantly, it is not based on dogma. What is it not? Okay, it is not doing nothing. So when you get called and you say, ah, you know, it's a polytrauma, uh, he's unwell, we really can't do much, I'll see him in the morning. That is not damage control surgery. It is not an excuse to stay in bed. Um, and importantly, it's not meant to be a convenience for the surgeon that, you know, again, I mean, we, we, we know how it happens that, you know, polytrauma comes in and you just, you know, are too, too tired, you've had a long day. So you decide, ah, you know, today I'm not feeling strong, so I'm going to damage control this one and I'll, I'll see him, I'll see him in the morning. Now, it's, you know, like I said, it's a, it's a physiological decision that needs to be made. And it is, not, it is not a regression to old techniques that now because polytrauma patients never used to be treated so now we're with surgery, so now we're regressing to that. So it's not a regression, like I said, it's management based on appreciation of patient physiology, resuscitation parameters and tissue oxygenation. And also we need to understand, you know, a little bit about uh, multi-organ uh, dysfunction and, uh, and remote organ failure. So in conclusion, um, you know, uh, if you go back in history, uh, this is, I mean, none of you will have used a K-nail, but uh, some of you will have tried to remove a K-nail, probably with lots of tears at the end. But uh, Gerhard Kunchner was a German surgeon who invented the K-nail. And as far back as 1967, when he did his, uh, when he published his surgical technique, his um, message was that you should not nail immediately, but wait a few days. Of course, he didn't have any physiological uh, parameters to comment on. It, it was just his observation from having done these nails that actually, you know, there are some patients that I put these nails on, but I don't make them so great afterwards. So maybe it's safer to wait. And, um, and that is the beauty of, um, you know, of, medicine and orthopedics you know specifically that you know the literature like i said is there to guide you but most of the stuff we do are based on you know clinical judgment and sometimes clinical judgment is something that's difficult to to quantify you know you just say look my gut feel is and of course you know you can't respect every gut feel that you that you uh, that that gets presented to you but there is definitely a place for someone who's been in the trenches and has done this thing many times to offer some of his um, of his observations. So again, going back to Alvin Toffler, so he says you can use all the quantitative data you can get, but you still have to distrust it and use your own intelligence and judgment. And this speaks to the, like I said, to the, to the laboratory tests that we do that you know are very difficult to just use on their own to decide um, which way to go with your patient. You have to use your own intelligence and clinical judgment over and above um, the stuff that you can measure. Okay, um, so like I said, we talk about early total care, we talk about damage control, but actually what we should be focusing more on is early appropriate care. You know, so if, if, if appropriate care means that you must X fix now and convert to nail later, then you do that. If appropriate care is that you must nail the femur or the tibia or plate the tibia or whatever you choose to do, then that's what you need to do now. So it, it just needs to be appropriate. Doesn't need to necessarily be either or. Okay, so that brings us to the end. Let me stop this and then try and find you guys. Um, ah. 
Um, okay, I see Mayanda, you've raised your hand, so you go first. Hi, Prof, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can, but let me just give your volume some warm up. Okay, yeah. Um, so in terms of early appropriate care, what, I, what I've noted that we do at Protescir, we usually use a monoplanar X-fix um, for open fractures. Now, um, in the MO rotations, before we came there, we were doing the biplanar X-fixes. What role is there? Because the biplanar takes longer, firstly, and, the, and it goes against the principles of early appropriate care because we're trying to minimize um, cutting time and the second hit phenomenon. But yeah. the aim we're trying to get, as you said, is stabilization. So what is the point then of us doing these biplanars if we know we're not going to treat it to union with a biplanar? Yeah. So look, um, and it, it, again, I think it's just a question of, uh, of evolution in terms of where we've come from with x fixes Because remember, up until recently, you know, all open fractures were treated with a bioplanar x fix But the plan there was because we were treating them to union with the x fix And if we're treated it to union, then you need to be bioplanar. But, you know, if you have an acceptable position in a uniplanar x fix and the plan there is to convert to, to, to definitive fixation later, then you know it's perfectly acceptable to use a monoplanar. But importantly, more than saving your time, it also saves you money because I mean, X-fixes are expensive. But of course, if you are not able to maintain a stable position or a good position with, um, with a uniplanar X-fix, then you need to have a very low threshold for converting the biplanar. But I think in terms of it just, being pragmatic, if it's damage control, uniplanar is more than sufficient. Okay. Uh, just a follow-on question to that, Prof, if you don't mind. Um, it, it's, it's a patient that was actually in one of my trauma firms that presented in an M&M. Let's say you have a polytraumatized patient. Um, let's say there's a two uh, bilateral femur uh, and a closed uh, uni and closed tibia okay. that is uh, let's say sh transverse and shortened you manage to get in and you stabilize the femurs and then um the then the the, the parameters start going downhill and you have to abandon do you put on an x fix to lengthen that very shortened tibia because you don't know when you're going to go back to definitively fix it because what happened with my patient was the patient never stabilized and we only managed to take them back a week after the fact, 10 days. And we had a head injury, therefore the fracture then had to open because the patient threw off a lot of callus. So my long-winded question is asking, do you then X-fix to get the closed tibia out to length or do you just leave it? Look, I think it's going to depend. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to answer your question in, in, in two ways. So if it's shortened and your concern is, you know, difficult surgery probably later on, that's maybe a soft indication for trying to now put an X fix on and spend another couple of minutes uh, and you know, more minutes of exposure as well to, you know, um, to, to the cold elements. So I would not necessarily do it for that. And remember our default position with the tibia and damage control actually is to put uh, a back slab on. We tend to not push you guys to X fix them you know, if the position yeah. is not so bad. The only time that I would then X fix it is if it's displaced and it's threatening the soft tissues. So now if you think it's, if it's displaced enough, but your concern is that if we leave it in a back slab, the spike is going to poke through the soft tissues and convert this now to a you know to an open fracture or, or have some kind of a, a pressure sore on that soft tissue. Then the answer is yes. But it, but if it's purely for position, like I said, no, we can deal with that later with um, with a definitive surgery. So I would not necessarily add another thirty minutes now of trying to reduce that uh, just to make for uh, easier surgery later on. 
Thank you, Prof. Okay. Um, who else, whose hand is up? Okay, one second. Uh, okay, there's no hand. Chat, where's the chat? Um, um, so now, Mr. Slav Boskovic, so you probably can't find the emoji for hand up. Is it because you want to ask a question or you want me to show you where that emoji is? I would like to actually ask a question, Prof. Okay. Um, just uh, one question on early appropriate care and what, what we do. Um, and, you know, the Monday morning meetings, you spoke about how we always um, discuss this. In terms of those three parameters of um, lactate that you mentioned, pH and base excess, do you have to have, if you had a polytrauma patient, do you have to um, have all of those parameters in the green or as you were mentioning about lactate, you know, your kind of green, orange, red, let's say your lactate is, you know, below two, but your pH and your base excess on where, where you want to be, are you able to proceed with early appropriate care? Look, in all honesty, they actually all measure the same thing, um, just slightly differently. So they, they measure basically, you know, tissue oxygenation at cellular level. And there's been lots of toing and froing in terms of knowing exactly which one to follow. So for a long time, we actually went with the, with the lactate because it seemed to be the one that is a better, you know, representative of what's happening at cellular, at cellular level. So it became a, a more reliable one. But actually, when the British Army returned from the Iraqi war, they, their experience was that you're actually better off measuring base excess more than you need to measure um, tissue or uh, measure the lactate. So, like I said, it's, at the end of the day, it's one of those things where you must pick one parameter and just do it consistently. So if as an institution you want to look at the lactate, then that becomes your parameter. Because the difficulty, if you don't have a firm policy, is that if you look at three different things, and you've got three different consultants doing three different word rounds, you're never really going to know what to correct when things go wrong. Whereas if, you, if everybody sticks to one thing and, um, and you know, if things go wrong, you know exactly what to go back. There's only one parameter to look at. So it, it sort of makes your life a little bit easier trying to, 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 um, to optimize your, your treatment strategies. So we have chosen to stick with the lactate and that's what we do. Of course, we, we look, we'll keep an eye on the blood gas and ICU may care more about the blood gas, you know, once the patient, I mean, the, the base excess once the patient is in ICU. But in terms of the current literature, it seems to end our institution policy, we are more lactate than, uh, than base excess. But like I said, it's very unusual for all of them to not be abnormal and for all of them to not normalize at the same time. Look, there may be some nuances, you know, um, between them, but generally and grossly, they measure the same thing. Okay, ah, you found the emoji. Okay, Pravesh, at GSH, we really put X fix as damage control for female. Can you all read um, Pravesh's uh, question? It's on the chat, Kirsty. Um, put up your, so if you look at the bottom of your screen where it says chat, uh, you click on that. Or maybe, um, okay, okay, look, I'm going to read uh, Pravesh's question. So it says, at GSH, we rarely put X fix as damage control for FEMA in multiple injured patients. However, for those who do qualify for damage control orthopedics and we're going to theater for other procedures, like abdominal or laparotomy, we are told to leave the patient in a tumor splint until it gets better. My view is, okay, so look, um, like I, I alluded to earlier on, you know, most of the things are still in, in evolution and, um, and also there's lots of you know, allowance to be made for institutional practices. So the reason we tend to do that is that firstly, putting on an X fix in the femur is a nuisance. It's not as straightforward as an atypia X fix, and, and you all know that. So it is actually no quicker to put the X fix on um, than, you know, and, and the other concern, of course, is that, you know, 
with the prolonged time, you know, again, there's the issues about uh, with hypothermia. But thirdly, if the concern is a chest injury, then every time you put a pin through the femur, you're going to generate uh, emboli, which uh, you're going to generate fat emboli, which almost like, you know, again, defeat the purpose of what you're trying to, to achieve. So our policy is, and also the cost, I mean, don't forget the cost, um, but, you know, edifices cost um, are, are quite costly. So what, it's not that we are against um, um, X fixes, just that, you know, if you have a firmly, a firmly applied um, tumor splint that's going to, to immobilize your femur, it just makes for, you know, better or, or easier surgery afterwards. And importantly, it's not safe to say it's there to, you know, to, to save money as well. So it is something that's acceptable because like I said, the whole idea is that you want to stabilize the fracture. But there have been instances though where we have insisted on, um, on an X fix. Also, I suppose it depends exactly when the patient, you know, decompensates. Because also, I mean, so if it's something that's quite acute on the table, there's probably no time to do the femur did the X fix. So, so we'll say leave the thermos plane on. But the converse is also true where we feel that the patient is not that unwell, you know, so we expect him back in theater in, you know, in two to three days. So then rather just, you know, get the thermos splint on and then pro process other patients in his place. And then when it comes back after three days, we can then proceed with the nail fairly, fairly safely. So it, it's probably, I mean, I, I can extend the same uh, answer to the tibia, but the literature in most places will say, okay, it's tibia is fractured, put an X fix on, but I don't think it's gonna be any more stable than a properly applied back slab. So in our context, you know, it's, it, it just makes more sense and it's more prudent to rather immobilize the tibia with a back slab than, than with an X fix. Okay, um, I cannot see any other hands. Uh, okay, anybody, whoever has is, got a question, just ask. Um, I don't know if I've got... Ashley, uh, yeah? Yeah, uh, I have a question. So, uh, not just... Uh, so, in, in terms of... Uh, okay, so early total care versus damage control, uh, that's sort of clear to me. But in terms of a patient who's sort of almost too uh, uh, unwell for damage control itself. What sort of criteria do you use? Let's say someone has like, let's say a bad, uh, 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 let's say bilateral open tibia fractures, bilateral femur fractures. You start doing one x fix of a tibia and uh, the lactate is at five and then you know, it keeps climbing up and drop. When do you sort of feel, let me uh, uh, you know, even abandon further damage control and, and rush them to ICU? Yeah. So look, firstly, you know, the first thing is that, you know, your, your, the priority is always going to be the femur, you know, ahead of the tibia. So just keep that in mind that it's femur before tibia. And if someone is too unwell for damage control, then, I mean, that's when the anesthetist will say to you, listen, we need to get out of here. The thing is, I mean, we think that, you know, because I, I mean, as I said, I remember having this argument once with an anesthetist you know, wanting us to stop. And I said to him, but where are you gonna take the patient? He says to ICU, like for what? Because there's a ventilator here. So how, how is this ventilator in theater inferior to the ventilator in, in ICU? So surely you can ventilate him here and, and, and we can proceed. But the truth is that, you know, like I said, theater is very exposed. It's very difficult to keep a patient warm in, in theater. So if, if an anesthetist make the call that the patient is too unwell, even for damage control, then that almost becomes like one of those ethical questions, like, you know, how aggressively do you treat patients when you feel that their prognosis is not so good? So it probably will be on that, you know, um, continuum now that you look, know, he's too unwell even for, for damage control. So is even worth, you know, operating on or, or at least um, throwing any more resources at him. But of course, it's always a difficult question to, to answer under, you know, when you're under pressure. So uh, the feeling is that you always give those patients a chance. So send them to ICU. And, um, and with, with thermal splints, because I mean, remember that he's not going to die from, you know, uh, from his femur, femur fracture not having been X-fixed. A thermal splint, um, like I discussed now, is 
is an acceptable form of immobilization. So, so if it means you must do thermal splints and, and back slips, that's, that's fine too. Because may, maybe not as stable, but under those circumstances with that patient, uh, I think it's a pragmatic thing to do. Uh, thank you. Oh. Uh, last question, please. I mean, for, 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 um, thing is, there's lots of uh, nuances you miss when the question is written. So if you can just ask your question, uh, just ask it out loud, please. Sorry, I was just having trouble with my audio. Um, Prof, last question for me. Um, do you see any limitations in following an early appropriate care protocol? Um, if so, what are they? And then um, should we kind of be guided in terms of what you've said by really the two principles avoiding prolonged hypertensive anesthesia and just fracture characteristics like having you know fractures that require complex surgery and kind of use those as two guiding principles apart from the physiological markers you spoke about yeah so look it ends, i mean i'll make an example with um let's take for example someone who comes in with uh, a complex distal tibia that needs a uh, supreme nailing or sublime nailing or extreme nailing and you've also got a femur fracture in the same guy you know so yes of course you can he's borderline but he's borderline improving so you will do his femur nail right so that, so that's appropriate educate but now you know that when you start nailing his tibia as much as it's closed as much as he is stable but now it's a complex injury to, to fix for him. So it's gonna take you another two and a half hours. So again, the appropriate thing to do for him is to bail and you know, put him on a back slip and say, you know what, rather than prolong, uh, expose him to another three hours of hypothermia and, uh, and blood loss, I would rather stabilize this one in a back slip and then um, and, uh, and come back later with a more appropriate um, assistant and uh, less you know, pressurized um, conditions. So that's the whole concept um, that you know, it, it's called appropriate care for that, that you know, it'll always differ from patient to patient, depending on the physiology, differs from surgeon to surgeon, depending on ability, and it's gonna differ from you know, institution to institution, depending on available support. Thank you. Okay. Uh, no other. Actually, is it the same hand now or, or is it your right hand? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, it's the same hand. Uh, I'll remove it. Um, okay, guys, so no other questions. Um, okay, great. So we shall call it um, night. And I'll see some of you tomorrow. Good night.